Welcome to Pentecostal Preaching Channel. Please subscribe to the channel if you enjoy what you see. Hit the bell to be notified when something new is uploaded. Have a great day. 2 Kings chapter 11 Preserving the Royal Seed And when Athaliah, the mother of Ahaziah, saw that her son was dead, she arose and destroyed all the seed royal. Jehosheba, the daughter of Joram, sister of Ahaziah, took Joash, the son of Ahaziah, and stole him from among the king's sons which were slain, and they hid him. They hid him. Let's all say they hid him. They hid him. Even him and his nurse in the bedchamber from Athaliah, so that he was not slain. And he was with her hid in the house of the Lord six years. And Athaliah did reign over the land. I'd like for you to notice the term six. Let's all say six. There is more here than just the practical historical record. There is a beautiful type here that I would like to bring to you. Six is the number of man. It's the number of flesh. Seven is the number of perfection, completion. It's the number of love. It's the number of God. The seventh year, Jehoiada sent and fetched the rulers over hundreds and captains and guards. Notice, he called for the chain of command. He called for the heads of the people, those who were in control of all the people. He called for them and brought them to him into the house of the Lord. I want you to notice where all this activity is centered. The house of the Lord. And made a covenant with them and took an oath of them in the house of the Lord and showed them the king's son. Preserving the royal seed. Psalm 22 and 30. A seed shall serve him. It shall be accounted to the Lord for a generation. They shall come and shall declare his righteousness unto a people that shall be born that he hath done this. I preached a message from this two years ago. A seed shall serve him. And I told you there was so much revelation in it and so much power in it that I would never plummet. I preached it in two or three messages and never never got to the bottom of that. And just the other day the Holy Ghost brought me back by that same well and I dipped another bucket out of there. Isaiah 53, and you'll see just how this ties together. Notice that in Psalm it said, A seed shall serve him, it shall be accounted to the Lord for a generation. The Hebrew says, It shall be told of the Lord unto the next generation. From generation to generation it will be told about what the Lord has done. Alright? 53 and 8 of Isaiah, He was taken from prison and from judgment, and who shall declare his generation? Hallelujah. He was cut off out of the land of the living. For the transgression of my people was he stricken. I'm going to answer today who is going to declare his generation. In Jesus' name, you may be seated. <clears throat> There's some background work for this message that I need to do with you right now. If you'll take your Bible, please, and turn to Galatians chapter 3. We'll work in the Word of God here a little while today. And if you feel like I'm not being very evangelistic, and if you're visiting here and wondering how in the world we're going to reap a harvest out of this service with me giving a Bible study, just stay here a little while, okay? Stay here a little while. If we do the will of God, you'll see that the Holy Ghost does the work, not just the sermon. All right. Chapter 3. Beginning with verse 16. Now to Abraham and to his seed were the promise, promises made. Let's all say seed. seed. You will of course recognize that if I'm preaching about preserving the royal seed, I'm going to have to lay a foundation and tell you what seed this is. Of course when we say seed here, we're not talking about wheat or oats. We're talking about flesh. We're talking about humanity. But seed has always, it has its individuality. Uh, lettuce seed doesn't look like corn. And corn seed does not look like wheat. And wheat doesn't look like oats. 
all of these seeds are different. They each have an individuality. They have a personality. They are different. And so if we said seed, seed is going to praise him. That could be anybody. But I'm going to show today that there is a chosen generation. Hallelujah. Let's all say chosen generation. Already unzipped that bag and let that cat out, didn't we? Chosen generation. <clears throat> Hallelujah. In other words, God's going to choose a generation that shall declare his generation. In the Hebrew, the term generation means the following seed, that which follows. There shall be a covenant unto you to all generations. And when it says to all generations, it means passed on from generation to generation. This is the way God intended for his glory to be shared. The church is not just begun in the heart of God on the day of Pentecost. The church in the heart of God was begun from the foundation of the world. God had a church in mind when he made this whole world and made man on the face of the earth. He intended to have a church without spot or wrinkle. And of course, when sin entered in, then the plan was diverted and other means were sought. That's why in the mind of God, Jesus Christ was slain from the foundation of the world. The sacrifice, all through prophecy, can be found prophetically and foretold of because he would come who would bring righteousness. But the story here is, if Jesus Christ is cut off, then who is going to declare his generation? Who's going to pass this on? Who's going to tell it? Well, of course, the answer to that is the chosen generation is going to tell it. God has a chosen generation. I think he has a generation out of the generations. I think that the last day church is going to be a unique church. I really do. I believe the first church was a unique church. Don't you think it was? It was unique. This church could undergo persecution. This church could undergo fire. This church was geared to take beatings and stonings and imprisonments and, and still rejoice and write letters and tell epistles and give and go. They were unafraid. Let's all say hallelujah. hallelujah. The last day church is not going to be a staggering, anemic soul plodding along in the footprints of some former conditioned group where we cannot keep up and where we are just finally taking the tattered flag over the victory line on hands and knees. I don't believe that. I believe that God's church and his generation is going to be declared by a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, that we should show forth the praise of him who has called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. We've got to note the glorious crescendo in all of those phrases, the adjectives, the forms that are given. Glorious light. Hallelujah. Royal priesthood. Chosen generation. This is a staccato church. It's a militant church. It's a mighty church. That's because it's royal seed. And I'm showing here that we are of royal seed. <clears throat> he saith not and to his seed as of many, but as of one. And to thy seed, to Abraham, which is Christ. And here he says that what he was saying to Abraham is spoken of Christ. Now go on and see with me in 17. And this I say that the covenant that was confirmed before of God in Christ, the law which was 430 years after, cannot disavow. And that it should make the promise of none effect. For if the inheritance be of the law, it is no more a promise. But God gave it to Abraham by promise. Wherefore then service the law? It was added because of transgression till the seed should come. Let's all say till the seed should come. What good was the law? It was just added to try and hold things together. Until the seed should come. What seed? The chosen seed. Who said Jesus? Yes, Jesus. The Bible said he is the first fruits of them that slept. Jesus said of himself, except the corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. The harvest is supposed to be the propagation of precious seed. What was the first seed planted? It was the seed that came out of Abraham. The Bible said he took not upon him the form of angels, but was made after the seed of Abraham. Okay, so we're going to follow a bloodline here, a royal bloodline. 
19 again, Wherefore then service the law? It was added because of transgressions, till the seed should come to whom the promise was made. And it was ordained by angels in the hands of a mediator. Does that remind you of any other scripture? One mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. What did he do when he died at Calvary? He preserved the royal seed by planting it. If you want to preserve seed, you've got to plant it. Brother Buckner told me the other day, I believe it was Brother Buckner, somebody told me they held some seed in their hand and said, I got some seed cheap. He said, uh, the man sold it to me real cheap because it was old seed. It was about 1972, 73 seed. And he said, uh, didn't cost nearly as much. It's okra seed. And he said, because he said, I don't know if it'll grow or not. But he said, I planted it and it grew. It was good. Wasn't anything wrong with it. But the way you preserve seed, if you just let it lay out in the open air, after a while it'll dry out and it'll just pass away. It'll just become like dust and pass away. The way to preserve seed is to plant it. And that's what Jesus Christ did. He took the seed of Abraham that had been prostituted by sin and unrighteousness, even after the prophets had tried to clean it, even after the seers had tried to tell it, even after all of the word of God had tried to wash it, Jesus Christ came, the righteous mediator, the perfect seed, and in order to keep it, he didn't put himself in some spiritual museum, he didn't hold himself back from us somewhere so we could all go chip a little off his flesh. He did say, this is my flesh in the New Testament that was uh, broken for you, and this is my blood in the New Testament that was shed for you. But he took all of that and spiritualized it so that every one of us could share in the royal inheritance. That's why we are now sons of God. Doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear we shall be like him. How come? Because the ear of corn is going to look just like the corn that was planted in the ground. And he was the seed that was planted that we, this generation, the chosen generation, the seed that should come, could grow. That's the generation that's going to declare him to the world. Let's praise the Lord together, shall we? Hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. If we don't understand this part, then the rest of what I have to say may be very hazy. Let me read a few more scriptures here. Romans chapter 4, verse 8. Romans 4 and 8. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. Cometh this blessedness then upon the circumcision only, or upon the uncircumcision also? For we say that faith was reckoned to Abraham for righteousness. How was it then reckoned when he was in circumcision or in uncircumcision? Not in circumcision, but in uncircumcision. Before he had become the circumcision, he gained favor, in other words. He received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith, which... He had, yet being uncircumcised, that he might be the father of all them that believe. Hallelujah. Though they be not circumcised, that righteousness might be imputed unto them also. And the father of circumcision to them who are not of the circumcision only, but who also walk in the steps of that faith of our father Abraham, which he had being yet uncircumcised. For the promise that he should be heir of the world was not to Abraham was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. In other words, it didn't stop or it wasn't centered in the law. The law was just there to hold things over until the other seed should come. How many of you remember we just read that now? You, you remember we just discussed that? It wasn't just after the law, so that when the law was gone, that was gone. This, in other words, this covenant that God made with Abraham is an everlasting covenant. This thing is going to go on and on and on and on and on. There's a little song that the kids sing. Uh, Father Abraham has many sons. Many sons has Father Abraham. What's the next line? And I am one, and you are two, as we go marching home. Amen. Yeah. Let's all say, Father Abraham. Amen. The Bible says, after the Spirit, we are sons of Abraham. Yeah. Why is that important? Because the covenant was made with Abraham. To thee and to thy seed. To thee and to thy seed. I want to preach today that the church is not just a gathering together of morsels and souls and people. 
one from this side of town and one from the tracks and one from down on that side and one from over there. It is not that. The church, in fact, is a royal priesthood. The church, in fact, must be newborn. Because if we come to God after the old flesh, we are of the earth earthy. We are of sinful nature and unblessed seed. There has to be a spiritual transformation take place to put us into the house of God and into the church of the living God. Don't ever let anybody tell you or fake you out and make you believe that you get in the church just by coming together or just by believing and then all these other things happen as a result of your believing. No, sir. There has to be a regeneration so that the seed that was in Jesus Christ becomes seed in you. It's royal seed. Amen. Amen. There are so many scriptures. Acts chapter 3 talks about the Jews and the Gentiles being the same. Hebrews, the second chapter, talks about God coming in the form of flesh, not taking on him the form of angels, but taking the seed of Abraham. The whole chapter, the ninth chapter of Romans, talks about this issue of circumcision and uncircumcision. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, would you turn there with me please? 1 Corinthians chapter 2, this beautiful, blessed, old verse of scripture. Verse 9. <clears throat> Let me begin with verse 7. But we speak the wisdom of God in the mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory, which none of the princes of this world knew. For had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. That lets me know the devil doesn't know who the royal seed is. I want to say something else right now, too. Now, lots of folks think the devil's working real hard because he thinks he's just about to be lost. He knows that he's going to be lost in hell. He's just about to be lost, and so he's working as hard as he can to get everybody else to go with him to hell. Wrong. The devil is deceived. Let's all say the devil is deceived. The devil is deceived. He thinks he's going to live forever. He thinks he's going to overcome God. He really thinks he's going to kill the church. He really thinks he's going to destroy the royal seed. He really believes he's going to do it. People who get a reprobate mind are folks that believe a lie. And the Bible says that the devil is the father of lies. He's the daddy of that whole business. He's deceived from the beginning. He's still deceived. He thinks he's going to win. I want you all to say that. He thinks he's going to win. When the devil gets after you, he's not just trying to get you to burn with him. He is trying to de destroy you. He believes his kingdom is greater than God's. He believes that he is above the throne of God. He really believes he's going to succeed. Bear that in mind. Yeah? Nine. But as it is written, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. Hallelujah. Let's worship the Lord together, shall we? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I want to show by that verse of Scripture that the devil doesn't know who royal seed is. If he had known, he would not have crucified the Lord of glory. If he had known who Jesus Christ was, he wouldn't have killed him. So I'll say amen. He doesn't know who the church is either. Because he's deceived. That's why he works on everybody. He's not sure just what's going on. He's living in deception. I'm telling you that the church is the only thing that knows who the church is. The Bible said the foundation of God standeth fast having this seal. The Lord knows them that are his. That's what makes the foundation stand. The reason why this whole thing, the whole worldly system is going to crumble is because Satan doesn't know what he's got and what he doesn't have. He thinks he's got you, and he thinks he's got you, and then he loses that, and then he's grabbing for that. He's just grabbing everywhere. The Bible says he knows the time is short. He knows the time is short, but he doesn't know he's going to be destroyed. He thinks he's just got a short time to work, and then he's going to survive and win. 
He's not going to do that. He's going to, he's going to be damned. You know that. We've read the back of the book and we know the church is going to win. But don't forget that the devil has always tried to destroy the righteous seed. The royal seed has been the target of satanic force since the world began. And you can believe that in the last day, more than ever in the history of the world, when the time is short, Satan is going to do everything in his power to destroy the people of God. You know what he does? He works on reaction. Someone asked me the other day, why is it when I start fasting and praying, everything goes wrong? That's because the devil doesn't know who to get after. And if he sees any sign, any sign of your spiritual desire, immediately you're going to be met with a task force of evil denomination to come against you, to try and hinder you, to try and stop you because he doesn't want you to be the church. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You know, when all of the crisis centered around Joash, he was just a lad, a small child. Athaliah, his grandmother, the mother of Ahaziah, when she saw that the king was dead, this was her opportunity. The king had been strong and had for many generations been strong. And kings had come and had come and come and gone. And now there is the intervening of this woman, this godless woman, Athaliah. She intervened when she saw that her son was dead. She rose up to take over the throne. She's going to control everything. Now, I said the other night, I don't, I'm not here speaking derogatorily against the ladies. I want you to understand what I'm saying. But in Scripture, always world systems and ungodly systems are in the female gender. They are. For example, Mother Babylon or Daughter of Harlots. These are always in the female gender. Always. And the reason for that is because they are productive. They have the seed and power of production and reproduction of their own systems within them. They themselves become creative because they hold the power of enlarging themselves. You remember the scripture talks about the system, Babylon spreading herself over the hills, spreading herself out over the mountains. This is a system. World systems are in the female gender. I think we have more in Athaliah here than just the story about a wicked woman who one time tried to become queen. I think we have a story here of world systems and godless systems that are constantly trying to take over the seed royal. And these systems are progressive. They have the womb in them to create other systems that are just as godless as themselves. All they have to do is just get a little fertilization, some kind of support from worldly means, and they can create and create and create and create until after a while you can look around and believe that all that there is in the world are the systems of the world. And in the same time that these systems seek to rule and to control the throne that God gave to David, and David in this case would be a type of the early church, because he as a prophet first saw the church in the tabernacle of David. The Bible said God built David a house. The Hebrew said God gave David a space in the dispensations. He elbowed a space open. That's why David did not worship God like everybody else worshiped God. This is the first man who ever put music with worship. This is the first man who ever played instruments with the worship of God. It was David who in his prophetic vision of the early and the late church and the whole church age caught a vision of what God wanted in praise and in worship. He saw everything in Christ from the birth of Christ to the glorious ascension of the church caught away into glory. That's why in the book of the Acts, Luke could pick out the words of Peter and trace them right back to David concerning the resurrection of the dead when he said, Thou shalt not leave his soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. He just lifted out of all of the glorious prophetic writing of David a portion in which he saw the resurrection of Jesus Christ. 
David is an example of the beginning of the glorious prophecy of the church ages. And so I can believe that he would be a type in this instance. And his throne would be a type of the early church. You remember that in church history, the church went on for a few generations worshiping and serving God. It wasn't long until darkness swept over them. The priests, the Hebrew priests that came in and were one to the Lord. Evidently some of them did not drop their Hebraic worships. Some of them brought things with them like censers and robes and what have you. This is what, this is what in Catholicism or in the capital or original church so called. Why they still have their robes and call men father. And why they still have their censers and they still have so many things that you can trace back to Hebrew origin. Because the Bible said a good many of the priests believed. What happened was that after a while there was not a total separation from other religions and from self idealism. There was the intermingling of things into the pure Christianity of the early church. And it wasn't long until the church was lost in apostasy. 325, they changed the form of water baptism to a triune version. It wasn't long after that until the world and the church merged and mingled and married. Constantine joined the church, but he would not be a monotheist. He believed in many gods, and so the version of Godhead was changed until anybody could get in and anybody could believe anything. So it was in the kingdom divided. If you remember, David reigned, and then after David came Solomon. And after Solomon, the kingdom was torn up and divided. It was God who appeared to Jeroboam on the road and sent a Ahijah the Shilonite to him and said, If you will do that which is right in the sight of the Lord, and if you will keep the statutes and the covenants of the Lord thy God, and if you will send the people to Jerusalem to do worship in Jerusalem, then will the Lord be with you, Jeroboam, and he will give all of Israel to you. Come on, Jeroboam, go back to David's tabernacle. Go back to that one great kingdom. Go back to basic Christianity. Go back to Bible freedom. Go back to the Word of God. Go back to that one Christian faith. Go on back, Jeroboam. Jeroboam couldn't do it. He said, I can't do it if I let these people go back to Jerusalem. To That's where everybody's got to go. Before the end of time, we've all got to go back to Jerusalem. Because the mother of this system is also in the feminine gender. Jerusalem, which is above us, is free, which is the mother of us all. There is one system in this world that stands against all other world systems and church systems, and that is Jerusalem and her children. The royal seed. The royal seed. The kingdoms were divided. They were all torn up. All kinds of ungodliness entered in. Wicked men came and went. Jeroboam started it in the northern kingdom. It spread to the southern kingdom. He stepped out on his balcony and showed two golden calves. And when he showed them, he said, Behold, O Israel, the gods that brought thee out of the land of Egypt. Can you imagine that? A man that has just had a visitation from God. God just got through talking to him through a prophet. That man took his coat and tore it up into ten pieces and said, God's going to give all ten of these to you. He's going to give you everything. And that's not all he said, but he said, if you will let these people go back to Jerusalem to worship, he'll give all Israel to you and build you a house as he built for David my servant. In other words, give you a place in the dispensation. Eighteen kingdoms and dynasties after Jeroboam, right on through until the taking away by Nebuchadnezzar. Eighteen of them followed calf worship. Let me show you something else. Men who were touched by God in the interim only went a little way, Brother Patton. Can you remember with me Asa? You remember him? And then he trusted in the Lord, you know, to a degree. And then... It came to a point where he could not trust in the Lord and he looked unto the physicians and he sought after help in the Egyptians and one thing or another and the Bible said he was sick, he had a disease in his feet and he died. And these men, they would get a little light and then when they got a little light then it seemed like they passed away and then the whole thing cycled back over and over again. Let me tell you another one, Jehu. He's a good example. Uh, Jehu. I think about him quite a lot, how the Lord put it in his heart. He came roaring into town after 
Ahab was slain. Jezebel's propped up in the window all painted up like a circus clown. And she's sitting up there making eyes at all the soldiers passing by the street. Jehu comes roaring up in his chariot, driving furiously. The Bible said that the Lord dealt with him and the Spirit of the Lord was upon him. And he slew all the sons of Ahab and he tore down all of the wicked seed. And he killed. He said, who's on the Lord's side? And somebody stuck that out the window and he said, you? He said, then throw her out of that window up there. And they threw Jezebel out the window. One old black preacher said one time, they cast her down. He said, cast her down again. They cast her down 70 times 7. It wasn't quite that way. But they threw her out of the window. (laughs) They threw her out of the window and she died. That's right. The dogs ate her flesh. This man was trying to clean up. Let's all say clean up Israel. Trying to restore the royal seed. Trying to get the church back where it needed to be. You understand what I'm saying? You understand what I'm preaching about today? And yet, with Jehu's zeal, the Bible said he had a zeal for the Lord. He had a zeal for the Lord. And yet, when he came right, you know what he did? He called all the Baalites together. Yes, he did. He said, I want to proclaim a feast for all of the priests of Baal. And they all got together. He said, I don't want one to be left out. We want to honor all the priests of Baal. All of them. We don't want one to be left out. So they all came together and he cut the head off with a sword <laughs> and put him in baskets and took him out and stacked him up beside the city walls. That's all they had a zeal for the Lord. And then when you read right down to the last of his little epitaph, you'll find in the final lines, But Jehu trusted in the calves, the golden calves that were set up by Jeroboam his father. You see, as much as we don't like it, the unholiness Uh that seeds in this society is passed on through us in so many ways. It takes a real experience with God to root out the ungodliness and the evil that tries by every means to slip into our homes and into our lives. There are people who lose their souls because we try to get them away from the world or get the world away from them. They feel like we're taking something away from them. No, no, you can see where they are now. They're there because their heart was there. They loved that stuff. They wanted it. Now they've got it. They're not of the royal seed. There has always been the cry in the great prophets. A cry for restoration. A cry for going back to God. A cry for going back to Jerusalem. It has always been the theme and the heart of the great men of God throughout the old Bible and into the new. Well, Athaliah rose up to do the final damage. She decided that there wouldn't be any more kings. She would become the last of all great leaders. And so when her son died, she took all of his sons and all of the seed royal that was connected, and there were lots of them. There were lots of them. And she had them slain with a sword. But what she didn't know was that while they were out butchering those boys, laying them out there, three, four, five, six, eight, ten years of age, one of the sisters to the deceased king got one of these little fellas and hid him up under her garments and robes. Shh, Joash, shh, don't say anything, darling. Shh, come, come, nurse, come, hurry. And she slipped in the house of the Lord. And way back in the priest's chambers, where the priests sleep, where no one else ever goes or gets, she took this little fellow back there, and she hid him. And it was the priest of God that knew he was there. The priest of God. Hallelujah. I wish I could tell you some of the things that are in my heart. I'd I'd like for you to listen to me just for a little while. David saw this situation, and he talked about it again. If you'll let me refer back to the prophecy of David. I think he's talking about the church hid in the time of evil, waiting to be exalted. Listen to him in the 143rd Psalm. Deliver me, O Lord, from mine enemies. I flee unto thee to hide me. Teach me to do thy will, for thou art my God, thy spirit is good. Lead me into the land of uprightness. 
I'd like for you to think about Joash. How many years was he back there? Six years. He didn't see sunshine. For six years, he didn't go out and play with other boys. For six years, he didn't get acquainted with other people. You imagine keeping a child, taking your child, and keeping him in a room for six years. That would be confining. It would not only be nerve-wracking for the child, it would be nerve-wracking for the maid. It would be terrible conditions. A child that loves to catch butterflies and in the evening watch fireflies and who is so inquisitive about life, everything from dust to stars. Wouldn't it be tough to keep some little live morsel like that locked up for six years in one room? And yet, for the sake of posterity, and for the sake of the royal seed being propagated, this boy never left his quarters. This maid never left her station. She just didn't go down and get an ice cream cone and leave it unguarded. There was some very scrupulous, very hard, very tenacious activities going on to guard the royal seed for six years. That's the number of man. I think it's, I think it's more than just a number six in years. I think it's the time of the nations. That like the time of the Gentiles is written in Scripture in sixes. The, the revelation of the Antichrist and the mark of the beast is in three numbers of sixes. This is the type of flesh, the type of man. What really is being said here is that the world system set on the throne, that the church system that's supposed to be ordained and governed by God, she killed all the other possibilities and sat down. But God, back in the back of the glorious house of the Lord, somewhere in the Spirit of God, had a royal seed all through the length of time for man to fulfill his unrighteousness. God had somebody hidden. Hallelujah. God's got something waiting on the church. Believe me, we are not in our greatest hour. We are not yet in the greatest glory. We have not seen the greatest day. Hallelujah. We're still in the bedroom. We're still in the back of the house of the Lord. God's going to open the door someday and the church is going to manifest Him to the generation. Hallelujah. Glory to God. What else did David say? Thou art my hiding place and my shield. I hope in thy word. What else did David say? <coughs> Thou shalt hide them in the secret of thy presence. From the pride of man, thou shalt keep them secretly in a pavilion. From the strife of tongues. Blessed be the Lord, for he hath showed me his marvelous kindness in a strong city. I said in my haste, I'm cut off from before thine eyes. You're listening to the cry of a Joash in a dark room waiting for manifestation. Nevertheless, thou heardest the voice of my supplication when I cried to thee. Oh, love the Lord, all ye his saints. For the Lord preserveth the faithful. That's what he's doing. And plentifully rewardeth the proud doer. Be of good courage. And he shall strengthen your heart. All ye that hope in the Lord. How many of you are still with me now? For a he goes on to say, Thou art my hiding place. Thou shalt preserve me from trouble. Thou shalt compass me about with songs of deliverance. Hallelujah. So, that's sometimes the only thing I can do is just sing. I feel like I'm compassed around with songs of deliverance. <clears throat> I mentioned today that sometimes enslaved people have 
and ethnic cultures have often contributed a great deal because of the hope that shines out of their poverty, whether it's self-inflicted or whether it is increased upon them. Still, hope shines out of all of that, and they, they sense hope, and they sing about it. Sometimes the only thing that shielded them was the songs they would sing in the fields, and the songs they would sing in the evenings, and the songs they would sing in the mornings. <clears throat> this is not just something that relates to a people. It's something that is God-like, and that is the people who wait in hope often they are compassed around or about with songs of deliverance. They're singing songs about when I get out of this little room, I'm going to be the king. When I get out of this little house, I'm going to see the throne. When I get out of this little bedroom, I'm going to stand out on the porch with pillars. I'm compassed around. All around me all the time are songs that have hope in them, deliverance in them. Hallelujah. What was David writing about? He was writing about the church being preserved until the time of the manifestation of the glorious church. Hallelujah. Praise God. What else did he say? From the time of trouble, he shall hide me in his pavilion, in the secret of his tabernacle, shall he hide me. He shall set me up upon a rock. Jesus said, Upon this rock I will build my church. The gates of hell shall not prevail against it. What is the secret of his tabernacle? The secret of his tabernacle is that we are not just in the building, inside the walls, but that we are part of the building. We are lively stones built up. And that in Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ in us, is the hiding place for the world. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous runneth into it and is safe. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. We are in that time when the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain. What for? Waiting for the manifestation of the sons of God. I'm telling you, even the devil don't know who the church is. He thinks he knows. He tries to know. The world doesn't even know who the church is. That's right. Only the church knows who the church is. And the only way the church knows is the way that God knows. The foundation of God standing sure. The people that are on that foundation are in the secret of His tabernacle. They're hiding in the pavilion. God's got them in the back room. Hallelujah! Athaliah and all the church systems and all the world systems cannot destroy them. One of these days, the priests of God are going to bring the king out. But before he does, God's going to manifest his plan to his captains. He's going to manifest his plans to the undermen. He's going to show them to the men who rule in the court. And the Bible said he, ca he commanded a covenant with them that they should serve the Lord and that the king should serve the Lord. And then he showed them the king. There is one great revelation that is going to explode over this charismatic world. There is one great revelation that is going to begin the tying together of all of the loose ends of denominationalism that are coming apart at the edge. The threads that are being pulled out by all kinds of hunger and total, absolute disdain for deception. People who no longer are willing to be pushed back in a corner and told farce and folly. They want to know what the Word of God says. They're not listening to the preacher anymore. They want the Bible to speak to them. This is the end of side one. Please stop the machine at this point and turn the tape over. Book. They want an experience with God. Hey, that's not all by chance. God's getting ready to announce the captains and the kings where the church is. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He 
that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God in Him. Will I trust? Surely He shall deliver thee from the snare of the fowler and from the noisome pestilence. He shall cover thee with His feathers and under His wings shalt thou trust. His truth shall be thy shield and buckler. A rock underneath and shields all around. And it's the foundation truth of the Word of God. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. <clears throat> Hallelujah. For many years I have been convinced that the church as we know it is not all there is to God's plan on the earth. I've been convinced for a long time that what we say is the church and what we say is God is not always all there is to what God has in mind. <clears throat> it is really rather comical to see men play their ploy on one another and ply their trade on one another in the name of the Lord to try and convince one another that they are somewhat while trying to convince the other that the other is nothing at all. It's been common with us to decry any experience anybody has from God or we magnify anything God does for us. And we hear common statements like God's been better to me than anybody else in the whole world. And we hear people say, I'm so glad I know the truth. I just feel sorry for all these people in the world that don't understand. Well, now that's, that's true and that's good to a point. But let me tell you something. We need to open our, we need to open our beady eyes. And our blatting lips need to be silenced long enough for us to behold the glory of the Lord in the land. What's wrong is that we have become, I'm going, to, I'm going to say some things today and I just just feel just right to say these things. The Holy Ghost laid them in my heart. Just, just fasten your seatbelt and hang on, okay? We are so much the children of world systems and we are so accustomed to church systems that we are willing to judge everybody by what we acknowledge to be right or wrong. Hence, we have become the judges of evil men's thoughts and deeds. We have set ourselves up as being something God never called us to be. We're like yapping dogs barking out through the sideboards of an enclosure when we really ought to be sitting patiently, grooming ourselves, waiting for our deliverance, and for God to manifest to this world what truth really is. The Bible didn't call us, God didn't call us in His Bible, to be judges of men. The Bible said, Ye are my witnesses, saith the Lord, and my servants whom I have chosen. I love that word, chosen. And the reason I love it so much is because it has something directly to do with the royal sea. God's not going to use just everything. God's not going to accept just everything. At the very beginning, you remember how straightforward God was about his attitude with Abraham. It was Abraham and his seed, and the rest of them can go hang. How many of you know throughout the scripture that that's the way it looked in the Old Testament? The Canaanites, that was too bad. God would take land away from them and give it to Abraham. God would take something away from the Gentiles and give it to his son Abraham. And when it's, you just follow that process through the years and you get Jesus coming after the seed of Abraham being a Jew by by natural birth and by physical birth. You just take a look at his attitude. He being the perfect Christ, being the perfect God and man. Listen to what he has to say when he talks to his disciples. Go not into the way of the Gentiles. Don't go out there and just go to the lost. I am not sent but to, but to, except to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. 
bang. Here comes a woman, a sorrow permission. Here comes a woman pleading. My daughter is grievous and vexed with the devil. He wouldn't even answer her. She pleads some more. I know you can help me. My daughter is grievously vexed. He comes back with this answer. It is not me to take the children's bread and give it to the dogs. I want, come on, you've got to see this with me. I want you to see how cloistered God is. I want you to see how clannish God is. You say, well, God loves everyone. He loves the royal sea. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But when this whole thing winds down, he's not going to have everybody in his arms. He's not going to have the whole world scooped up against him. He's going to have one nation, and one nation only. And it's going to be a nation of kings and priests. They're going to be royal from the word go, because they got the royal seed in them, and that's all he's going to have. He's going to wind it up just like he started. To you and to your seed shall the promise be reckoned. You say, is that really true? That's really true. This same clannish Christ who looked at that woman and said, I'm not going to give the children's bread to dogs, actually called the woman what everybody else in the society was calling her, and that's a dog. She's a Samaritan. She's an outcast. She's not of the seed of Abraham purely. Even though half, they were half breeds, really. They were half Jew and half Gentile. Samaritans were. And even with half of that, he wouldn't accept her like that. You've got to be pure bread. You've got to be absolute royal seed or else. And then she came by with something that turned his whole philosophy upside down. She said, but even... The dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. And here's where he introduces something that lets the whole Gentile nation in the door. He said, woman, great is thy faith. And this is what spurred the Apostle Paul when he stepped back and he said, I didn't go. He said, when the Lord appeared to me and chose to use me to preach the gospel among the heathen, immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood. I knew Simon Peter couldn't take it. I knew James wouldn't understand it. There's no use for me to go to Jerusalem now and talk about Gentiles getting in. They won't know how to hell that. He went out for three years into the desert in Arabia and he sought after God. It was only after that time he went up for 15 days. Then he went back and he didn't go back for another 14 years. Why? Because God was doing an unusual thing through faith. He's the man who comes out writing. You've got to understand why so much of this discourse concerning the circumcision and the uncircumcision, the Jew and the Gentile, because the Jews know that nobody can ever get into God's family. Nobody will ever be royal seed. Nobody will ever be sons of Abraham unless they're born into that family. That's the only way you're going to get in. But that's when the Apostle Paul said, he looked back if you please, I've got to believe that the same spirit that moved my Lord when he saw the face of a Gentile woman pleading for her daughter, she's not mad and turned away because Jesus called her a dog. She says, even the dogs get some crumbs off the master's table. I'm not asking for too much. Jesus healed the girl. He overcame the ethnic line. He went over the Hebrew boundary. He performed the miracle. He went on and did it. The Apostle Paul took the same road and walked down the same path of faith when he said the seed of Abraham is not reckoned unto Abraham only. And not only to the seed of Abraham, but to all of them that walk in the steps of the faith of our father Abraham. And that's why 
And he was saying that it's not reckoned by the law. It's not reckoned by whether you are a Jew or not a Jew. But it's reckoned according to faith in the promise of God. And somebody get up and say you don't have to be born again. That's why water baptism is the fulfillment of the type of circumcision. To get into Abraham's family, you've got to be water baptized in the name of the royal seed. Colossians chapter 2. You forget the philosophy of the world, vain deceit, traditions of men. Forget about Athaliah sitting on the throne. Hey, back here in this back room of this little temple, waiting to be brought out. Come here, little boy. Come here, Joash. Let me talk to you. In him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principalities and powers. Hallelujah. In whom also we are circumcised. In him we are circumcised. We get to be sons of Abraham in him. In whom also we are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands in the putting off of the body of the sins of the flesh, buried with him by baptism. Is that what the scripture says? And then the promise was made to Abraham, but the Bible comes along, the New Testament scriptures of the Gentiles and said, and the Holy Spirit is the seal of the promise. Made to our Father Abraham. And by one Spirit we are all baptized into one body, whether we be Jew or Gentile, bond or free. And we've all been made to drink at the same fountain. Man, that means I can be royal seed. But I'm still crazy about the word chosen. Chosen generation. First Peter chapter 2. Royal priesthood. Chosen generation. Who's going to declare his generation? Who's going to pass it on from generation to generation? Somebody passed it on to us. We got it somewhere. The whole key is that while we've been in the back room, you know, you get people together very long, doesn't matter how much they love each other, they fuss after a while sometimes. They stay together a long time, they get tired of each other. That's right. It's good for a man to go to work. It's good for a lady to clean house. See? The man didn't have to go to work and the lady didn't have to do anything. He said, well, we're just going to sit around here and kiss all day. Husband and wife. No, you get tired of that after a while. There's more to life and more to enjoying life than just sitting around there hugging each other. And everybody knows that. Their activity makes life and love stronger. You get people locked up in a place so long, even the church, no matter how much the church loves the church and how much everybody loves everybody, there still is that feeling in us. That we're all locked up here in a little pen somewhere called the church. Really, that's not the fact. The fact is that the church has not really yet been revealed to this world in the last day. And that's right. It is my opinion that God is going to bring His glorious church out. Hallelujah. And when they start shouting, God save the king, he is the king. But all of the seed royal that has been spared, we are going to be kings and priests unto our God. You say, well, that's when the Lord comes again. Well, I believe that when the Lord comes again, we are going to be married to him. We're going to be his bride. The Bible says, now are we the sons of God. And it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But now we're the sons of God. I know we're going to be his bride. We're going to share everything he has in eternity. We're going to be heirs and joint heirs. But I believe that right now, right now, God wants us to be sons of God. Are you all still here? Let me tell you some of the heresy that has divided the body of Christ for years. I dare to talk about these things because I think that we need to understand. Simply because spirits Reign and because we have Athaliahs on the throne doesn't mean that God still doesn't have His church in order. We're right now troubled about world systems. We're hearing so much about gasoline and food and shortages and crises and, and the salt treaty about to be signed and, and being sold down the river. What we do is sign a contract with a nation that doesn't keep its word. 
we all bind up and decide we're going to stop the arms race, and they just go underground and just keep making them big missiles. And uh, you say, well, Brother Handy, you think I just, I just don't know what you think, but if I've got an opinion, if I've got a right to an opinion, I think we're crazy. The only way America will ever be the nation that she can be is just to, just to get as big and strong as she possibly can. And if they'd ship all these communists back to Siberia... But I'll tell you what, but in our government, in our nation, they can work in our, they can work in our security plans. And then sneak all the information, everybody, everything we know, everybody in the world knows. We don't have to have spies anymore. We've got people in high authority, people in the government that are socialists. And it's no secret anymore. You say, well, what can we do about it? That's what, that's what I'm talking about. The hopelessness of the systems eventually seeps over you until you just are frantic. It's just that feeling like, dear God, what is this all coming to? Until you realize that those systems have nothing to do with God's program except to fill time. That's when you quit worrying about it. Talking about the trouble in the last days, and it says, See that you be not troubled. All these things shall come to pass. Nation shall rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. Why not be troubled? Because God has us in a hiding place. God's got his royal seed somewhere preserved under the shadow of the Almighty. I want to tell you, I want to tell every backslider something. I want to tell every sinner something. It's not a matter of whether or not you like to join up with the local church. You're not getting mad at Brother Handy or getting glad at the singers or, or getting along with the folks in the congregation. God's not just building some little something out here on campus drive. God's church is bigger than all of that. That's the only thing that's going to survive is the church of the living God. It's the only thing that's going to survive. Nations are going to crumble. Systems are going to fall. I'm going to talk a little about church systems. That includes organizational systems, denominational systems. I am not anti-organization. I believe that the church should be organized to do the work of God. We're organized here. I don't know how far that organization can go before there are particular problems. I don't think that there has to be a general organization. I don't think that everybody has to be tied up with everybody else. Let me tell you what I think happens eventually. There is the perpetration of the idea, and I think that it is diagnostic. I think that after a while, it cuts right into the heart of Christianity itself. And that's what systems do eventually. And that is that if you are not what I am, or if I'm not what you are, then you're no good. Huh? And if you don't belong to what I belong to, I'm no good. Now, and you know what? It will ignore the hiding place. It will ignore the rock that we're built on and the shield that we hide behind. Because I can be baptized in the same name you're baptized in, filled with the same Holy Ghost you're filled with, speaking tongues like you do, believe in the same doctrine, but I'm lost and you're saved because I'm not where you are. Now, I don't believe in that. I never did. I don't believe in that now. You know what that is? That's the spirit of Athaliah. Where'd everybody go? I said that's the spirit of Athaliah. In Jesus' name, Pentecostal ranks, we've got more than 40 Jesus' name organizations. I've been in a lot of them and around a lot of them. You know what I'm finding out? I'm finding out that a lot of those people just believe just like I've always believed. That's right. They're good people. Some of their pastors are good pastors, sweet people. And then some will say, yeah, but you know, some of them don't hold a standard. All you got to do is we walk across the street and look at our pack. They don't either. But it's okay if we don't do it in our system as long as they don't do it in their system. As long as we're in ours, it's okay. I'm telling you that systems, not people now, not good people, not churches, good sweet people. We love them, I love them, but I'm telling you the church systems eventually become hierarchy. It isn't long until after a while they do not premeditate it, but it does spawn some kind of an avalanche of selfishness that eventually separates men from men. God in the last day is going to ignore all of that garbage. That's going to come down. If you'll remember, in the New Testament, this same spirit got into the house of Chloe. And one said, I am of Paul. And another said, I am of Apollos. Another said, I don't know, I'm of Christ. I'm not with none of you. And the apostle Paul came by and said, hey, wait a minute. 
He said, one planted, another watered, but God gave the increase. And it's not Paul's, and it's not Apollos's, and it's nobody else's. It's God's that gives the increase. And the church doesn't belong to one organization or another. The church belongs to God. It's a royal seed. I'm telling you that God's going to tear all this little business down before this ends up. Government systems, world systems, denominationalism. Denominationalism has been the curse of deeper light and walking on with God. People get one little truth and sit on it and say, that's all there is. Somebody else goes a little further and they get a method of repentance and then they sit on that. And then tradition eats away at that before long. And you see, what we have is kingdom after kingdom after kingdom after kingdom happening. We've got one system after another system after another system. And then comes the big world system. Here's where we... The big world system comes in and tries to kill all the seed royal. Cut everybody off. And when that happens, God's going to reach right over in the back room. And while we've all been huffing and puffing and saying everything's gone, everybody's dead, and nothing's going to work, and nothing's going to happen, God's going to drag Joash out. And you know how he's going to come out? He's going to come out with a voice of the priest, which means God is going to cause this to come to pass through the ministry. Kings and captains are going to be informed and they're going to make a pact. That means things that are in authority are going to submit to the priestly responsibility. And when that happens, the people are going to shout, God save the king. I have always believed, my father preached when I was just a kid, preached there was going to be a great last day revival. I've always believed that there would be a great outpouring of the Holy Ghost. A few weeks ago, somebody came to me, a friend of mine that I've known for many, many years, and said, Brother Handy, I heard you preaching a few years ago. You said there's going to be a mighty outpouring of the Holy Ghost. It's going to be a great end time revival. I said, look here where we are now, right down here right now. And he said, where is it? I said, well, I think it's going on all around us. He said, do you mean to tell me that you think that happening out there all around there is the revival? He said, man, you know that if it don't happen in here with us, it can't be God. That's right. Hey, does that shock you? That's the attitude of hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people. And they're God's people, but that's their attitude. You say, well, God's going to kill them all. No, no, not, God's not going to kill them all. So you're preaching against organization. No, I'm preaching for the royal seed. Preaching for the royal seed. I'm telling you that if God doesn't pay a bit more attention to that than you do walking through a spider web. Well, must need I, I think I need to beat on that stump a little more. Seems like it's kind of in the ground here. I'm just telling you that church systems perpetuate themselves. Denominationalism has done the same thing. When one denomination goes this far and stops, and here comes somebody else, and they ease on up here, and they stop right up here. Here comes someone else, just like a graph, one past another, and they accept this and stop here. Here comes the quote-unquote Trinity Pentecostals, and they accept the baptism of the Holy Ghost, but they don't want water baptism in Jesus' name at that time, at that time. And they didn't, it wasn't the Baptists and the Lutherans and the Presbyterians that fought hardest against the revelation of God in Christ. It was the people that had the baptism of the Holy Ghost that were Trinity-based. Man, they fought harder than anybody else. We still have the attitude that all the of God folks are a bunch of devils. Now, I want you to stop just a minute. You are classifying people according to systems and systematically when God doesn't do that at all. He does not do that. There are some hungry people all over this world. Some of them in the Assemblies of God, and some of them in the Southern Baptists, some of them in the Methodist and the Presbyterian. And I want to tell you something. They're not your people. They're God's people. And you didn't lead them. God led them. And what we need to do is pray for them so that when God reveals His glory, I want to tell you what I'm praying for. Now, this may be a bunch of heresy, but I'm preaching in my own church. Hear me now. I don't believe that God has called all of these people 
out of denominationalism and away from Athaliah to call them into the back room to slit their throats somewhere under the bed. They won't all last either. Some of them won't make it probably. But that's not my problem. The fact is I never dreamed that what happens now could happen. Even in my highest regard for faith, I never dreamed that 20 million people would receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost in 1978. But over the world, they did. It is acknowledged now from every denomination. And the report is in at this time that more than 20 million people received the Holy Ghost speaking well of tongues last year. Now I'm going to tell you what's bad. What's bad is when you cease being the royal seed and start being the system. The system has to kill that. The only thing the system can do is to decry anything that isn't it. All it can do is say, I don't think there's anything to that. See, they don't know if there's anything to it or not. They just have to say that. Yeah. Athaliah cannot say, oh, wonderful. You mean there's some more sons? You mean there's some more people receiving the Holy Ghost? Oh, wonderful. Praise God. This is God's work. He's going to lead them. He's going to reveal himself. No, all we can say is, well, they may talk to them, but they don't know about what about baptism is. And, you know, we say that so fast, it just slobbers all the way down our chin. And you can feel the jealousy. And you can feel the bitterness. I'm telling you that that spirit has got to go. That Athaliah, it gets little children all over the place. And it's not long until that spirit gets into preachers. And that spirit gets into churches. You know that there are lots of churches that would rather hear about somebody dying than then hear about people getting the Holy Ghost. One of my pet peeves when I was preaching revival... Hey, how many of you folks... Are y'all all right? One of my pet peeves when I was preaching revival meetings would be to listen to preachers run down other preachers across town. Say, well... Any other churches here in the city? Uh, how, how's the work doing here in the city? Oh, I right, some more here, but there's not much to it, you know. Oh. How many other churches are there here in town that preach the truth? Oh, I guess three or four, if you call it truth, you know. How many of you know what I mean? Now, that's a dirty spirit. And I lost more meetings and got put out of more churches for getting on to that with all of my incisors. <laughs> God won't send a revival to folks that sit around thinking they're the only show in town. We need 50 more churches in the Metroplex bigger than this one. And if we had them, you know what? The whole bunch would be biting on each other all the time. That's what's sickening and sad. That's right. I'll tell you another thing. All the Joashes would be running from bedchamber to bedchamber, too. Because that's, that's one of the fun little games of the church. Is if I don't like that preacher, I'll go across there and use that preacher. And so the spirit of Athaliah is not only on the throne, but it's in the bedchamber, too. Around the hiding place. You know why? Because they are not necessarily in Christ, and Christ is not necessarily in them. And if there isn't a total baptism of love of God, understanding of purpose, plunged into the will of God, people can gnaw and chew and cannibalize on each other until there isn't anything left but just bones and trash. It used to be sad to me when somebody would say, Oh, they had a great revival over there. They had 25 or 30 received the Holy Ghost. Oh, yeah, I know, but there's all backsliders just prayed back through. It kind of leaves you there just kind of hanging and say, Oh, was that bad? You know what I'm talking about? That's the spirit of Athaliah. It's the spirit of the systems of this world. It should never have gotten into the church. It doesn't belong in the bedchamber. If we're going to preserve the royal seed, you're going to get rid of that attitude. You're going to quit hollering against people whom God is touching. You say, yes, but they still wear their makeup. You ought to see how they're decked out and all. Well, put your hands down and just appreciate the fact that you didn't tell them enough for them to get the Holy Ghost. They got that somewhere else. And they're getting water baptism in Jesus' name without hearing you. And it's a good chance they're going to find out the rest of the truth without you saying anything. And before you show all of your ignorance, why don't you just shut up? It's a bad...
bad thing to make fun of something God's at work at. We just go back and assume that when this thing started back in the 1900s, we all just, boop, we just popped out here a glorious church. No such chance. All the carrying on and the mess and all the going on, I've listened to enough of the stories from enough of the old men of God, and I've been around them for years and listened to them. My daddy among them. He told me the other day when we were in New York, he put his arm around my shoulder. He said, Mark, if you had lived back when I lived at the breaking out of the Holy Ghost, he said, we've got the idea that this church came in dressing right, living right, doing right. He said, we used to have more trouble with preachers and people. And he said, all kinds of things. He said, it was just years and years and years before we came to a knowledge of other truths and faiths that held us steady. It didn't happen all at one time. This, we're 70 years old, 80 years old in this restoration. We've come along here year after year here and preaching, 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 preaching. Generation after generation after generation. We just assume everybody else in the world ought to be just like us. And since they're not, we think they're not nothing. I want to ask you, who baptizes these folks with the Holy Ghost? How do they speak with other tongues? Do you think that's all of the devil? No, you know that's not right. God's poured out His Spirit in the last day. And just because all of them are not true don't mean some of them aren't. Where is your faith? You've got to have a little hope if you're going to live in a bedroom for six years. You've got to have a little faith if you're going to live in a dark room for six long years. If you're going to live out the interim of man's existence until God is ready for the manifestation of the church, you've got to have some faith and some patience if you're going to be one of these royal seeds. That's the only way you're going to be one because you're not necessarily Abraham's kid by birth. It's your faith that got you into the sea. It's your faith that put you in the bloodline. Why all this negativism? How come you can talk against them when you're a Gentile? Man, we're all here by grace. I think there was a time when we had to be strong and hard. A time when we fought and wrestled and beat and banged and defended and had our hands up and... Every time we walk, go past the church saying, Oh, there they are. Send to the gods. You know, making fun and carrying on. But you know what I found out just the other day? I'm learning all this good news as I go along. In the East, there are over 1,000 Assembly of God preachers who have been baptized in water in Jesus' name. And they're starting to baptize their congregations in water in Jesus' name. 1,000. And they have been baptized for years in Jesus' name. And nobody knew that because they, were, they wouldn't tell anybody. That's right. Brother, you told me something the other day, Brother Pierce. You met the son of a, a grandson or nephew or somebody. Brumbach. Okay. Brother Brumbach wrote a book. Years ago, he called my father's name along with the names of other older ministers who had written articles and booklets about the mighty God in Christ. Brumbach, one of the strongest uh, antagonists against Jesus' name, baptism. He uh, said his nephew is a personal friend of Jim Pierce. God has opened them the door and they've been talking together. The last time Jim talked to him, he said, I, he said, I, believe, I, could, I believe I can see this thing. He said, I... I can accept this thing. I'm starting to see this thing. See, what we've been doing for years is we haven't been able to acknowledge that God's big enough to take care of His own business. And if we got something that says, so thank God, let's share this thing. It's been like, look out, if you don't believe this, I'll knock you right on the nose. I'm going to tell you what I believe God's going to do. I believe that not only out there, but I believe that in here, there's some scab. Everything you see in here is not good red meat either. The Bible said there must be heresies among you, so that they that are approved may be made manifest. I don't know any organization in the world that doesn't have some fallacy. I don't know any man-made system anywhere. Any church organization. I know some of them seem to be better than others. But I don't, th I don't know one anywhere that doesn't have some problems. That's right. I don't know any local churches that don't have some internal problems by times. People don't have disagreements. Do you know some places that are perfect? 
Well, if you do, don't go there. Whatever you do, don't you go there. Because you'd run it. Human. As long as we've got an Athaliah for a world system, Athaliah spirit in the government, an Athaliah spirit in denominationalism, often an Athaliah spirit in church organization. As long as you've got antagonisms and war, trying to kill everything that's not me, trying to destroy everything that's not just what I am. As long as those systems and spirits are alive, it's going to be a bedchamber hiding situation. But you know what I believe God's going to do? I believe God's going to take the royal seed that is preserved by its love for God's Word. Let's all say preserved by the Word. Anytime we stop walking in the Word of God and shut off revelation and turn off the light, then we don't have fellowship with God anymore. Because we have fellowship only as we walk in the light, as He is in the light. See, the problem with so many is that you can say, well, I, what I came into was good enough, it's going to be good enough for me, I'm just going to walk in it. The thing we don't realize is that we didn't arrive then either. God's got more for all of us. How many of you really believe God's got more for us? And any time you do that, that's the spirit that ends it all. That's the spirit that kills everything else and says, I've got everything I need. You have to say that after a while. If you say, what I came in two years ago is enough, that's all there is for me, I don't need anything else, then you have got to eventually say, I've got everything. That's an obvious result. I don't feel that way. I thank God for what I have. I may have something someone else don't have, but that don't mean I've got everything. I'm still hungry for God. I'm still willing for God to show me something. I'm willing for God to tell me something. I'm willing to learn. I'm willing to hear. God's going to take the royal seed that is hidden in these denominations, hidden in church organizations, hidden all over this world. I believe that God is going to take his ministry and by the preaching of the word of God, going to bring that all together at the destruction of the world system. And there's going to be the great coming together of the church of Jesus Christ. Man, there are people all over the world we never heard of that know God. They love the Lord. You say, what about these folks that don't, they don't have the new birth? Well, we're praying, we're praying that God will help them. But if they don't get help, they're not going to be in his bride. That's right. They're not going to be sons if they're not born again of the water and of the Spirit. I'm talking about born again sons of God. I'm talking about people who are born of the water and of the Spirit. It doesn't hurt my feelings when I hear of people by the hundreds and thousands being baptized in Jesus' name. It doesn't hurt my feelings when I hear of people by the hundreds and thousands receiving the Holy Ghost. Does that hurt your feelings? That excites me. You say, yes, but it's happening with them. How come it's not happening with us? We've been, ha- we've been having things happening for years. They haven't had anything. We ought to be rejoicing with them. We ought to be thanking God for them. You say, well, we've got to be careful. We're liable to backslide. No, we're not going to backslide. Not unless that's just what you've got in mind to do. God's preserving the raw seed. I believe there's raw seed in a lot of places. We don't know where it is. I believe God's going to bring it together. Hallelujah. You say, well, what is the church? The church of the living God is the raw seed that shall declare his generation. And the local church is the bedchamber. It is the place of rest in a wicked generation, a wicked and adulterous generation. You folks that don't have a local church to be in, you don't, you're not under a ministry. I believe that the church is going to be called together by the ministry. We're going to be drawn together. We're going to move in step, in tempo, right on into the plan of God in the last day. And if you're not in the place where you can hear the voice of the shepherd, I don't believe you're going to make it. I believe that the local church is an absolute necessity. The only system, let's all stand, shall we? The only system that God recognizes is his church. It's the only thing that will prevail. But remember, the devil's not going to kill it, can't kill it. No way it can. 
God is going to preserve His royal seed. Lift our hands and worship the Lord together, shall we? Hallelujah.